Support for this podcast comes from Frito-Lay in the 2023 Snack Bracket Championship. The Frito-Lay Snack a Challenge is underway, and fans are voting on their favorite snacks to crown champion. We're talking about primetime matchups between the best 64 snacks in the land. Will Ruffles Ridges reign supreme? Can Doritos defend their dynasty? Or will Smart Food use their smarts for a surprise upset? Only you can decide. Get in on all the action for a chance to win up to $1,000 or a year's worth of snacks. Let your snacks be heard. Just go to frito to vote and enter for a chance to win. No purchase necessary. Sweepstakes ends April 3rd, 2023. Void but prohibited. Here's worth of snacks awarded in the form of 52 coupons, each good for one bag of chips. See official rules at frito This is the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. Now, here are your hosts, Jeff Sharon, Eric Lopez, and Brian Murphy. All right, all right. Welcome in, Jeff, Brian, and Eric with you here on this uh, Wednesday, October 14th, 10.30 about Eastern time. Just giving you the timestamp just in case more news breaks. I don't know. It's just been that kind of a year, folks. Welcome into the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. So glad you could join us here uh, as, uh, wow, the baseball season is almost done. The bubble is done in the NBA, and then we can fully pay attention to college football just in time for UCF to go to Memphis uh, again, like the, the the place where we, <laughs> the last time we went there, one point game, right? I mean, I, Murph, you said you're headed up there to to Beale Street. Is like, is Beale Street even open? I, I'm gonna. I mean, I, I assume so. I don't <laughs> think. I don't think. I don't think Tennessee is under full lockdown. So uh, yeah, but yeah. I'll, I, I do plan to be up there. Well, as, at least as of right now, it looks like they're going to get the game off, which is more than we can say for several SEC programs. Oh, look at that. Look at, look at Jeff showering wow. his own shit. Yeah, Jeff seriously. is just showering in his own shade. He's, he's patting himself on the back. For others' misfortune, how it's, you're a sick, you're a sick, sick. I don't, man. I don't do, I don't do Schadenfreude well. I, I really don't. Anyway, so we got lots to talk about. We're going to preview UCF at Memphis after the bye week. UCF got it, got the weekend off. Did they work on the things that they were supposed to? Uh, sort of clean up the penalties and all that. Well, we're going to get a good test. Uh, as as everyone remembers, the last time UCF was in the Liberty Bowl, that one point game. Uh, we have a guest on the show, Jeff Brightwell from the. Uh, Memphis uh, Tigers Radio Network joins us, a uh, longtime friend and uh, and a, a returnee to the show. So we'll hear from Jeff on the latest on the Tigers this year. Uh, and we'll also talk a little basketball. Colin Smith deciding he will not play this year. We'll have some details on that um, with Murph, of course. But uh, first order of business, of course, is UCF and Memphis. Knights coming off, of course, the loss to Tulsa at home at 2-1. Uh, a week off to work on all of the uh, issues from the first three weeks, and then they get to go to the Liberty Bowl. Uh, of course, the Knights in the uh, all-time series are 13-1, and one. Um, but UCF is a, a three-and-a-half-point favorite on the road. 71% of the money, according to Odd Shark, is on the Knights, over under 73 and a half. Oh, boy, guys, we're expecting a lot of points in this one once again. Well, I guess that shouldn't be. Too much of a surprise, right? But uh, uh, Murph, I want to start with you. By you know, you've been talking to the coaches, you've been talking to the players over the past couple of weeks. Do they feel like they have tightened up the things that were not working in the first three weeks? Uh, have they? Do they feel like? Yeah, I think they do. Um, it, I guess it would be more alarming if they came out of the bye, and of course, everyone's asking about the penalties and had four and consecutive snapped. false starts before snapping the ball. I mean, <laughs> yes, and then if they came out and they said this week. Uh, nope, we haven't fixed anything. We're real worried. We don't know what it's going to look like. We don't know. Of course, they're going to put a good spin on it. Um, but the fact is, the fact is, and this is going to be a really short podcast, we don't know if they've cleared up their errors until we actually see them play. Uh, good night, everybody. Yeah. Because, I mean, really, because uh, there's no insight that we can get into this. No one is allowed to see practice. We, we're not in the meeting rooms. And so they can say, as Josh Heupel has said on Monday, and as I'm sure he'll be, I'm, I'm sure as he'll say on, again when we, we talked to him on Thursday, you know that they, that he's confident that they've they fixed their errors and they they know they need to stay ahead of the chains and understand that everybody needs to get set and they've worked on it. But that's fine. 
we had the same discussions after the ECU game, and it only got worse. So for anybody looking for answers before Saturday, there will be none. Uh, the only the only way we're going to find out anything is in, is when the game kicks off, and then we will find out what exactly this team worked on over the bye week, and if it actually worked. Well, Memphis. What, well, yeah. Well, I, I would I, I would I'm say I, I think the other question is who's playing. We may not know on some of the guys, but we actually have some answers there. In particular, Murph, Richie Grant, who was made available to the media. Yeah, that's a good sign, right? Richie had a really scary moment there uh, against Tulsa where he lowered his head to take out a running back and the running back's knee basically slammed it into, into Richie's head. And Richie was down on the turf for some minutes. It looked like he was was clean, def- definitely out for a while. Uh, Richie talked a little bit about that play this week, about how he remembers the first thing he said when he sort of came to is, you know, I don't want to let my guys down. He didn't really want to come out of the game. He wanted to come back into the game. He didn't realize, you know, how hard of a shot he really took until he was able to look back, look at it, you know, after the game on tape and, you know, realize that, you know, yeah, it, it looked pretty scary. Um, but he, I think he said he, he kind of gained all of his memory of that entire play uh, slowly as the week went on. Uh, but the, the 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 upshot is he was made available to the media on Monday, and you don't do that for guys who are not going to play in the, in the upcoming game. So the fact that Richie was out there on the po- in the po- on the podium tells you that he's going to be good to go. And you know Otis Anderson was was certainly dinged up in the fourth quarter against Tulsa. Well, he did talk to the media after the game on Saturday, so you would assume he's good too. And Josh Heupel said on Monday that he expects. You know, the running backs, Greg McRae, Batavius Thompson, Otis Anderson, all of whom missed the most, you know, the, the ending of that game to to play. Um, but we won't know for sure, you know, until until Saturday. We're also tracking Antoine Collier, Parker Boudreaux. Certainly people still want to know about Trey Nixon, although I, I just I, I think it's less optimistic there. Um, so there's going to be a lot to watch on Saturday as far as pregame warm ups. Um, but certainly with Richie out with Richie on the at the podium, he seems like he's got the green light. What about Marlon Williams? Because he he also had a scary moment on the last play of the game against Tulsa. Yeah, that's another one. So actually, it was funny. Uh, Josh was asked on Monday uh, about Marlon and Trey in one question, and then sort of everyone else in another question. And so when it came to when it came to uh, Otis and Greg and Batavius and Richie. He said, I expect those guys to play, yada, yada, yada. But on the question of Marlon and Trey collectively, he said, no, we don't have an update on those guys. So uh, different answers there, uh, which you can read into as far as you want. And, you know, Marlon's another guy that we will definitely have to see if he's out there on Saturday at about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, an hour and a half before kickoff for warm-ups. Yeah, that's good. that's going to be a big thing to watch because, you know, this week Marlon and – uh, his teammate Jalen Robinson were both a- added to the uh, Boletnikov Award watch list uh, uh, off of uh, uh, based on their performance in the first three games, and well deserved because both those guys have been fantastic. But without Marlon out there, I mean, he's been he, he's just been a, uh, a a supremely important target for Dylan Gabriel so far this season. And without him, you kind of wonder what's going to happen. Because I think if I'm not if I'm not mistaken, also because of the rules. Uh, Jakaias Cradle also will not be available for the first half against Memphis, too, because Correct. he had, he had that targeting call in the second half against Tulsa, right? Right. Uh, again, the, only the second one that Josh Heupel has said he's you know he's seen his entire career, but because it happened in the second half, he is he is forced to miss two entire two halves, and thus he will not be available till after halftime of the Memphis game. Boy, it's going to be. It's it's gonna we just gotta hang in there and, and wait and see right but uh, nonetheless it's uh, it, it, by the way the predicted score here on Odd Shark I find interesting forty two to thirty seven in favor of UCF um, Memphis comes in one and one uh, they are they won their uh, opening game the paint bucket bowl Eric Lopez against uh, Arkansas State uh, and then uh, lost in a thriller. Uh, last week or, or two, or, excuse me, two weeks ago to um, SMU, thirty to twenty-seven on a last-second field goal. Eric, 
I, I feel like this Memphis team is just, you know, they, they got a real stick in their craw. Obviously, they, they know that you see they know the situation with UCF. A lot of those guys left over from the two consecutive years where these two teams met up in the championship game with the American uh, and lost in uh, in equally frustrating fashion both times. Um is, is is this a major upset alert for UCF with Memphis because you're on the road? I don't. Well, I don't. I don't like the word upset here. I don't think it would be a stunner if Memphis won. Uh, I think UCF this is, is look, favored by three and a half. Yeah, but that's not. I hate when like, oh wow, what an upset! What was a three point favorite? I mean, that's not an upset to me. If you're like a 20, 30 point favorite, that's a significant upset. I mean, I don't think anybody. I mean, to me. These two teams have proven that they're pretty close. The difference is UCF's found ways to win in their matchups. I, what's so fascinating about this game is you talk, you're you talking about the last three conference champions here with UCF winning in 17 and 18 over Memphis. Memphis obviously winning the conference championship last year. You have a situation now where they have a new head coach, Ryan Silverfield, who, by the way, was a grad assistant at UCF in 06 and 07 part of the mm-hmm. Conference USA Championship. I don't know how many people remember that. He's in his first year head coach, taking over from Mike Norvell, who went to Florida State. And this is like a big game for them because even though they won the Conference Championship, they didn't go through UCF, and UCF's given them some heartaches. I mean, think back to that 17 title game and that dramatic win. 18, coming from behind to beat them. That regular season game where Memphis was up 30-14 to 14 at one point, and UCF came back 131-30 in the famous fourth and one from deep in their own territory. There's been a lot of pain caused by UCF to Memphis. So I think a lot of those Memphis guys and the fans, this is a game they've circled. And I think this game has been the premier game in the in the league right now in the last few years. I think this is Memphis's big rival, and I think it is to some extent. You know, UCF may not act like that's their rival, but this is the team they've had to go through to win both conference championship games. And now you have a situation where both teams are coming off a loss. These are two of the favorites in the league. The loser of this game will have two losses already in a year where there's no divisions. It's not like in the past where, hey, you just worry about your division games and it'll work itself out. Now you're battling against everybody. So to me, this is a significant game for both teams here because in a year like this, if you lose a second game, you lose the tiebreaker and all that, it's going to be really hard to get to the championship game for the loser of this football game. So this is a significant game for both teams. And What's weird is we don't have a grasp of Memphis because of what's going on with them. Remember, they lost a game with against Houston due to COVID issues they've had. So they've only had two games in, and we I think they're still trying to figure themselves out. So I, I you know, Murph, I when I think of UCF Memphis games, I, I I parallel it to a Christopher Nolan movie in that you go in thinking one thing, and yet during the movie it kind of manipulates me into thinking that something else is going to, is going to go in a different direction in the movie only to find out at the end that, well, the movie ended up where I thought it would probably end up, but it went in a completely different direction than I thought it would. And that's kind of how I feel about these UCF Memphis games. It kind of goes in a lot of different plot twists every time these teams play. I I appreciate your efforts to, to try to (laughs) boil this down into into a movie metaphor. I don't know if it, if it landed, uh, because Christopher Nolan movies are are, are a, a little more uh, ornate, but I appreciate the effort. <laughs> I, I will say this: you could throw uh, in your own director if you man, to Mer- describe it there. You know? <laughs> let's give Be- let's give Eric a little slack here. I mean, that's that's a I, pretty. I appreciate the effort. I really do. I appreciate the effort. Uh, um, I'll say this: you know, yeah, obviously Memphis is going to be gunning for UCF because it's a 13 game losing streak, and. And UCF knows this, too. They're very well aware of this. They've talked about it all week, about how they know that Memphis is going to be wanting to get this one because they're sick and tired of losing the ways that they've lost. Samari Maxwell said out front, he goes, if 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 uh, if we had lost them the way that they had lost to us, I would be hurt, too. Uh, and so they understand what kind of fire that Memphis is going to bring into this game. I also think it's fun to mention that uh, we've talked to a lot of the guys this week about what is what is their favorite memories of the the last couple of years, last three or four years against against Memphis. Uh, you know, what do you remember about those games? And I think Richie Grant said of of all of them, of the four 
of the last four they've played, which was the blowout in the regular season in 2017, which was the game I really thought uh, kind of sent a signal that this this program was now different and was headed in a really really different direction. You obviously had the the two champion the two title the two title games, and then the the game at, uh, in Memphis in 2018. Richie said that game in Memphis, the 31-30 game, uh, was his favorite because it was just such a battle. Uh, and, and really showed him a lot about the character of that team to, you know, while the defense was struggling and the offense was struggling, they just kept fighting and fighting and fighting in the rain and they found a way to pull out the victory. Um, and that's probably something they're going to have to do this time around as well. Uh, I think one key before we, I think we're going to get to our interview is one key that I, I think I, I'm interested to see in this game is if you watched Memphis's last game against SMU, they were completely torn to shreds by Reggie Roberson Jr., the SMU wideout, who is going to be in the NFL, uh, probably going to be a pretty high draft pick. Unfortunately, in the third quarter of that game, Roberson basically, I think, tore his left ACL. And But before he left, again, he only played like two – he played a little bit over two quarters. He had over 200 yards and on five catches. He was completely toasting them. And – and if UCF can get behind their secondary, and you know they love to do that and take shots down the field, I think the Knights can have some success with their, your Jalen Robinsons and your Jacob Harris's and hopefully Marlon Williams if he can play as well. That's something that I think that they have an advantage over Memphis. I got an interesting trend for you here, guys. You ready for this one? UCF is 1-5 in five against the spread in their last six games against conference opponents. Really? Yeah. So did, did they not, they didn't, they didn't, did they they not cover against uh, – oh, I guess they didn't cover against CCU, did they? You see no, that oh, that's touched. why we made bad beats with Scott Van Pelt, Murph. They didn't yeah. cover at the end there. Uh, yeah, I thought mm. they did. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Meanwhile, Memphis has won nine in a row at home, and uh, but the total has gone under in five of their last six. They've won exactly. nine in a row at home. They've won nine in a row at home. So I figured the uh, figure. So that sounds to me like the last loss they had at home was in mid October of twenty eighteen against UCF. Yeah, might have been. Yeah, yeah. you were there. And Memphis is and Memphis is zero and five against the spread in their last five games. So something's got to give. Something's yeah. got to give here. I don't know, man. All right, it's gonna be fun. It's gonna be really fun. It's gonna be. It's gonna be fun. It's gonna be. Might be a little weird, but it's gonna be like you said, Murph. It should be. It's just to be a good matchup, and and you can sense in both teams. I don't want to call it desperation because I think that's a little too strong a word, but you can sense the urgency. I think that's a good word. Yeah, Eric is right. This is a de facto elimination game. Yeah, I don't. I don't think you're playing for a conference title in a modified season with no divisions and two losses. Yeah, not to mention the fact that. You've got five teams in the American right now who are undefeated in conference. Uh, Tulsa, Houston, Cincinnati, SMU, and Navy. Navy is the only one who's 2-0. and Everyone else is 1-0. and So we'll see how everything else shakes out. Well, and, and this is an important week in the league when you, you know, starting Friday night, you got SMU going to Tulane. Murph mentioned SMU is going to be without Roberson. They are without their top receiver, one of their top backs for the rest of the year. So Shane Bouchelle is going to have to carry more of the load. And they go into Tulane, who they're kind of the weird team of the league because they've had big leads in their two games they've lost in the league. Yeah. You know, they lost. They blew a big lead against Navy. They blew a big lead against Houston. They're the Atlanta Falcons, or the American, if you will. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, but I'm just telling you. So, but that's a trap game for SMU in New Orleans. Then Houston, who we really don't know a lot about because they just played their first game. Thankfully, after all the issues they've had with teams postponing around them, they're hosting BYU, who's ranked on Friday night. So it's a nice little doubleheader there. And then Saturday noon, Cincinnati, who's in the top 10 in the polls at Tulsa, is Tulsa for real? I think if Tulsa, this is their chance to announce to them, to everybody that, hey, we're a legit title contender in the American. Yeah. If they could knock off Cincinnati, if you look at Tulsa's schedule after this game, it's pretty favorable. And obviously Cincinnati, have they, you know, have they replaced Michael Warren? You could argue that Cincinnati and Tulsa are the two best defenses in the league. And then you've got the marquee game, UCF Memphis, which is the ABC game. And you could argue that if UCF holds on to that lead against Tulsa, this game probably is on primetime in ABC instead of 330 ABC. But it is 
in my opinion, it's a significant game for both teams here as far as the 2020 season is concerned. Yeah, this is it, it, we, suddenly we have a pretty pretty significant in conference slate there. You're right. I I do have that Tulsa Cincinnati game circle. I mean, Cincinnati obviously three and zero. Tulsa one and one overall. But you know, it, Tulsa's got that game at home. I'm sure that team feels like they're playing with house money right now. Well, let me um, read you the Tulsa schedule. If they were to upset Cincinnati, first of all, if they upset Cincinnati. That's two wins over teams that were ranked. UCF was ranked when they knocked them off, and they played Oklahoma State and Stillwater very well. I think you could argue that Tulsa should be in the top 25 if they beat Cincinnati. You look at their schedule after Cincinnati. At South Florida, they're going to be a heavy favorite. It's a short week, but they're favorites. They host East Carolina. They're going to be favorites. They go to Navy, tricky place, but Navy, eh, they don't look great as they like they have in the past, and then they have that big game with SMU on November 14th. It's not mm-hmm. feasible. It's feasible that Tulsa could go on a win streak here and have go be undefeated going in conference play going into SMU if they could upset Cincinnati, which is why it is a huge game for UCF against Memphis. Because if UCF loses this game, that's two conference losses. You lose the tiebreaker head to head to Memphis. And remember, you lose the tiebreaker to Tulsa. So among others, and you still have a tough schedule ahead going to Houston, you're playing Cincinnati still. And for Memphis, it's the same thing. So this is this is a really a big weekend in the American. And, and I think we start getting some answers here about who are the title contenders moving forward. Mm-hmm. And I should mention also, you know, Navy, obviously, they're the only team at 2-0 and in the conference, but their wins were at Tulane by three and home to Temple by two. So, uh, so those are, you know, they still have a, a bunch of tough games left to go. They play at ECU uh, this week, and then they still have Houston, SMU, Tulsa, Memphis left on the schedule as well. So uh, a couple things to keep an eye on. All right, we're going to take a quick break with here for here. And when we return, Jeff Brightwell from the uh, Memphis Tigers Radio Network joins us to talk about the Tigers. What's the latest on Memphis's program uh, as they head into uh, this game with UCF looking for their first win over the Knights since 1990? Stick around. Black and Gold Banneret Podcast is back after this. Welcome back to the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. Jeff Sharon, Eric Lopez, Brian Murphy with you. UCF underscore Banneret on Twitter, Facebook.com slash Black and Gold Banneret. And of course, Black and Gold Banneret.com. Uh, joining us now uh, is uh, a member of the uh, Memphis Tigers uh, radio network broadcast team. He's been uh, a cohort of mine for the last several years covering. Uh, the American Athletic Conference Baseball Tournament. He does virtually every sport uh, that Memphis uh, handles. He's also the uh, pre- and post-game host uh, for uh, Memphis Tigers football on their uh, flagship radio station. Jeff Brightwell joining us here on the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. All right, Jeff Brightwell joining us from uh, Memphis, where UCF will be playing uh, the Tigers in the Liberty Bowl. How you been, Jeff? It's been a while. Yeah, it's been a uh been a strange year like it has been for everyone. It was hard to believe after, uh, you know, the spring we got done with our last Penny Hardaway radio show, getting ready to go to the conference tournament. And then uh, we didn't have another game broadcast. It didn't have another Tiger broadcast at all until the first Brian Silverfield show about a hundred and uh, I forget what I counted, but it was nearly six months. Fortunately, I was not on the baseball trip that week because the baseball team was taking a trip to Murphy's Bar to play Middle Tennessee, then go up to Indiana to play the Hoosiers. And I believe what happened is they played the midweek games against Middle and then it did a U-turn in Hopkinsville, Kentucky, when everything got banged. So I didn't have oh. to make that strange trip. <laughs> I know. And I, and I missed you in Clearwater this year. I mean, uh, it, yeah. was, it was rough, man. I, you know, it was, we were, I was just starting to get my, you know, get excited at that point. You know, with like a couple months out, I start, you know, really like buckling down on baseball once basketball kind of, Kind of goes by the wayside, and then that right. got wiped. We were hoping against hope that maybe there would be something salvaged, but it didn't happen. But um, you know, so- it, it was interesting this summer. Uh, it was almost like being back, you know, when you're, I wouldn't say high school, because by then you got a car and you're having fun with your friends. But you know, when you're in elementary or junior high and you, you get that summer break. You know, it wasn't. It wasn't. I'm not gonna say it was the worst thing in the spring, but boy, about the middle of the summer, late June, early July. I got mm-hmm. to uh, to the point where I was like, I'm I'm ready to start calling some games. This is enough break, and that's what we do. So it was uh, it was a nice break there for a while under bad circumstances, but man, it 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 wore on that we got to play some games. 
I know, I know. Well, it's sort of, kind of, maybe sort of a little bit back to normal now with uh, Memphis Tigers football. Of course, you're part of the broadcast team for the Tigers this year who, uh, and again, I, I feel I feel bad having to remind you of this uh, once again, Jeff, <laughs> but 13 to 1 is the all-time series between UCF and Memphis. Memphis' only win was in the uh, it was in the very first game that these two teams played back in 1990. That was when UCF wasn't even in uh, in division. A. Yeah, gosh, that's a long time ago. And of course, they played some of the most memorable games in American Athletic Conference history. The last three times that UCF and Memphis have played, of course, two championship games, and then of course the thriller last time UCF was at the Liberty Bowl, uh, 31-30. Um, different looking Tiger team this time around. Mike Norvell. Uh, is gone. You have a new head coach in Silverfield. Um, what have you noticed from on the, from the inside? What's been the biggest difference with the program this year compared to past years under Norvell? Well, it hasn't been really. You don't notice a ton of difference because Ryan, you know, was on. Uh, he was his associate head coach, his deputy head coach for uh, the, his Norvell's tenure. So, and then you keep Kevin Johns on as offensive coordinator, a couple of the other coaches, and you. You know, you tweak your staff because Mike took some of his staff, as you would understand, uh, down to Tallahassee. But it, it seems to have been a pretty smooth transition. Uh, it's it's hard to see yet because we've only been able to play two games nearly a month apart because of COVID uh, to really see differences and wrinkles and things like that. Because we've got Brady back and because Kevin Johns returns as offensive coordinator, I think you're going to see, you know, kind of the same type of offense uh, that you've seen in the past and who – New defensive coordinator, Mike McIntyre, who was the national coach of the year when he coached the Colorado Buffaloes a few years ago, did a good job to turn around San Jose State when he was there. So it's really hard to kind of get a read to, to tell the differences right now just because you have just a two-game sample size, two games apart. As far as working with them media-wise, he's been, he's been outstanding. He spent plenty of time in college football, a couple of years in the NFL, so he's very savvy in uh, doing the coaches' shows and interviews and – uh, dealing with us, which is always comforting. <laughs> yeah. Well, you guys come into this game one and one, and you're coming off that that thriller against uh, uh, against Shane Bouchelle and SMU, a coin flip game down in uh, down in Dallas. Uh, you yep. guys came out on the short end, thirty to twenty seven, uh, on a late field goal. But uh, what is the outlook from the team coming out of that game? Do they feel like they should have had that game and and let it slip through their fingers? What's what what, what was what was the the sense after it? Well, I mean, we're, they were obviously pretty disappointed. It's much like in the situation UCF's been in lately. You, you win so much, you just don't have those, you know, regular season losses. Eight eight to ten years ago, we wouldn't have thought anything about it. Just, you know, oh, well, tough loss of three points. We'll go try to get the next one. But when you, you started having the su- success we've had, it's uh, I wouldn't say it's devastating, but, you know, the fan base is a little bit shocked. But it's it's also such a crazy year. I don't think you're going to see a lot of, undefeated teams in college football. I could see our conference championship having both teams of two, maybe three losses before it's all said and done because it's a crazy year. But it's one of those games. We played Arkansas State and won, and then the next week we got hit with COVID. We stayed pretty, you know, it was pretty quiet all summer, uh, even in fall practice. And you kind of thought, okay, maybe maybe we're going to get around this. And then the week after the first game we got hit. So it was 28 days between our first two games. Uh, and as much as you can say that that's not a factor when you're trying to limit contact in there, you could tell the first quarter uh, they got down 24-3, got to within four points at the half, uh, and had a chance to win. We were driving for the game-winning field goal, and very uncharacteristically, uh, Brady White, they, they swiped his hand, fumble, and SMU was able to drive about 30 or 40 yards, kicked the field goal, and that was all she wrote. It looked there for a while. Uh, like we were going to get the comeback win and escape. But, you know, it's kind of like vice versa from what we deal with with you guys where you've had Memphis number. We've had SNU's number. So, uh, mm-hmm. you know, th- things like that are bound to happen eventually. And we've, we've been able to put it on them uh, pretty well the last five or six years. Last year was the close game, the ABC game. But it's uh, you just try to rebound two weeks later. It's strange that both UCF and Memphis are coming off losses and bye weeks. But here we are relatively early in the season. Yeah. Eric, go how, ahead. How much, you know, there's been, I've seen a lot of chatter at Memphis players talking about this is personal and this is a big game and the fans, this is a rivalry deal. They want to beat UCF finally. How big of a deal is it? How much of a, you know, UCF obviously 
two classic American Conference Championship games in 17, 18. I think that's where it all came from. And I don't think I don't think it's a it's a an inaccurate comment to say that UCF Memphis, you could argue right now, is the premier game in the league with for the excitement they've provided. Both yeah. teams have hosted game day. Both teams have won conference championships, have played uh some great games, have been on ABC a lot. Both have had head coaches, obviously, <clears throat> that have moved on after conference championships to uh, higher profiles. What What's the mood like in town about UCF game? Is it now one of those that it's circled and this is like Memphis's rival in football? Yeah, I, I think it's – I was talking to, the, to some people the other day. Even even though the Tigers were able to win the conference championship last year and got get the Cotton Bowl, I still think the perception around the league is you still got to – you know, with, with, with you guys with the multiple conference championships, the multiple uh, BCS now – uh, New York, New York, New Year's, excuse me, New Year's six bowl games. It's still, you got to get past UCF. It's not like UCF uh, had some huge down year last year. They didn't make the championship game. It's not like you guys fell uh, off the cliff or anything. I still think the perception is, Hey, you, you want to, you want to win the championship. You still, you still need to, to be able to, to get through the nights. And here we are. It's going to be our third game. It, it's kind of a weird feeling. And I'm sure it is with you guys too. If you host a big game this year, you know we're only going to be able to have a little over ten thousand fans in the stands. The first game, the the Shelby County Health Department limited us to forty five hundred, so at least we're able to get a little bit more than double that in a fifty eight thousand seat stadium. It's still going to seem kind of uh, well. It's not going to seem it's going to be very empty of just those eleven or twelve thousand fans that were able to get in there. Uh, you, you hear it among the fans, but it's, it's so it's just so weird to gauge fan wise when you're not going to go in tailgate and have the big crowds out in the on Tiger Lane in the parking lot and just, you know, everything you deal with on a college game day. Coach Silverfield, of course, he's he's gonna he's gonna tell you what most coaches tell you. It's been two years since we've played. Uh really the seniors and the juniors are the only ones that were highly involved in those last two championship games. You just try to look ahead and and play this game. The interesting thing is is if we are able to stay, and I think hopefully we've run through our spell with, with COVID, and as long as we don't run into any other teams that have to postpone or cancel, we're finally going to get on a, a stretch here where we play eight straight games. So now it's, it's cliche, but it's now you just you play this game, put your head down, and, and get to the next game. But it's, it's no doubt it's, it's a big, big game, and you've got to consider, too, no divisions this year. Right. Uh, you obviously you want to win the regular season championship to get home field advantage, but I mean, you're just trying to get the, the top two to give yourself at the conference championship. No doubt. No doubt about that. And and one of the keys, when you, I know Jeff is kind of relieved about this. There's no Daryl Henderson in the backfield. <laughs> I think you, Jeff, still has, Jeff still has nightmares of Daryl Henderson running over the UCF. And, I've, I've seen enough of him and Tony Pollard. Thank you very much. And, that's a, I mean, and, and, and Jeff, I mean, you guys, I would argue you're like running back you. I mean, with the great backs you've developed, Daryl Henderson's doing a great job with the L.A. Rams now, getting the opportunity there. Tony Pollard is with the Dallas Cowboys. And then, you know, even Antonio Gibson was on your team last year. He's with the Washington team. He looks tremendous as well. Uh, And that's a big part of Coach Silverfield, uh, you know, who obviously was the offensive line coach in the running game. Talk about the running game this year, though. Are we going to see the same type of style with perhaps even your you know running backs. Obviously the big story is before the year with Kenneth Gainwell opting out, right. but what, what do we expect to see from the running game there for Memphis? Cause that's obviously been a big factor in this matchup where uh, Memphis has had success running the football against UCF in particular in first halves. Well, that, that's, you know, that's where Memphis kind of had to pivot this year because uh, Kenny had to opt out in a half to, he did, uh, Oh, right before the season, and it was close to the beginning of the season, and a lot of fans did not know the situation. He had, I believe, it was four family members throughout the spring and the summer who passed away and all had contributing factors with the COVID-19. And it was an uncle a couple of weeks before the season that kind of you know, kind of put him over the top on that decision to opt out this year. So uh, you understood that. But the, the guy we're watching now, uh, and it, again, it's a two-game sample size, so the total yards don't jump out, but the average does, and that's Rodriguez Clark. Uh, he's he's gained over 200 yards on 36 attempts, averaging over 100 yards a game. Redshirt freshman Kyle Watkins uh, has gotten 140 yards for us. But the thing with Rodriguez Clark, when we have our broadcast meetings, uh, we do it once a week at the coaches leading into the games. It's but kind of standard. The last couple of years, when we've sat down with you know our former coach Mike Dorvell. 
And we were talking about Kenny Gainwell, Daryl Henderson, and, and the whole the whole crew. But he would always tell us, just wait, wait till you see Rodriguez Clark. This kid's going to be special. He's going to be the next big thing. So he was going to be a feature back with Kenny this year. And they were going to rotate him in like they did uh, a couple of years ago with Daryl Henderson. They kind of had a, a two back system. But all of a sudden, uh, with a redshirt freshman, he's thrust into the now you are the you are the lead back, and Kyle Watkins is kind of that number two back. So. Rodriguez has been impressive so far. He, uh, you know, very similar to, to Kenny Gainwell. He can break on the outside of speed, and he doesn't mind getting physical up the middle. So he'll definitely get tested this week because I've seen you guys play the, the Georgia Tech game, uh, saw a little bit of the ECU game. And, you know, everybody always talks about the speed UCF has, but y'all have always been a very physical football team as well. So he's definitely going to get tested this weekend. Let me ask you about uh, Brady White because looking at his numbers this year so far, you know, his completion percentage is through the roof at 71 percent. He's thrown for 576 yards in two games, seven touchdowns on three picks. But, you know, like you mentioned earlier, um, especially against SMU, you know, he's had he's had a couple of, you know, really soft turnovers uh, it, it, for you guys as well. How would you grade Brady's performance uh, right now in his last uh, season? Because he's a grad student. Is that right? Yeah. In fact, he's been, you know, he's a, he was at Arizona State. He was recruited by Mike Norvell when, when Mike was out at Arizona State. And he, he got the extra year because he had that, that ankle injury. He, he only played right. one series at Arizona State. He was going to be their next guy. You know, you, you get an inj- a bad injury, and then all of a sudden you just kind of disappear in, in college football because you know how recruiting is. They're, they're bringing in new recruits, and all of a sudden you're two years behind. Well, he gets to transfer a year to Memphis. So I believe it's. I believe it's a six year and now all of a sudden with the NCAA ruling, he could get a seventh year. He's not going to do it. I think he's I think he's had enough of his college experience and he'll test the one hundred after this. But <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean his picks have been, you know, a little as you said, soft this year so far. It's uncharacteristic, especially what the fumble down at, at SMU. You know, I feel I still think he is you're gonna get what you get out of him, a high completion percentage. He's never a guy that you're gonna just see him air it out 50 or 60 yards and throw it deep will be more of the, you know, the 20 to 30 yard variety, let the receivers do their work. I I would say the offense this year is going to produce similar numbers to what we produced under Norvell. It'll just be a little bit different. I don't know if you'll see quite as many of those quote unquote explosive plays. Uh, It's a little bit more ball control. I think where, you know, Mike, Mike wanted to score, you know, let's get down there and score where I think Ryan wants to, you know, be a little bit more uh, adapt to the, the clock management, use a little time, give the defense a little bit of a rest. Let's march down the field a little bit rather than just take that big strike on almost every play. Yeah. Well, he's got a couple of two, uh, he's got a couple of targets, you know, from years past. DeMonte Coxie is really, I remember you talking uh, about him a couple of years ago and we had you on the show. He's really blossomed into, I think, into one of the best receivers in the American and Sean Dykes, who was an unsung hero yeah. for Memphis a couple years ago, you know, guy came out of nowhere, had a couple of big catches against UCF in the championship game. Monster well, game, the 27th yeah. title game. We had actually earlier this summer, we had Trey Neal on the podcast when we reviewed that game, and he admitted to us they weren't prepared for Sean Dykes in that game. <laughs> they, they, they didn't. Yeah, they didn't prepare for him because he hadn't caught anything yet. Right. They were like, we don't need to worry right. about this guy. <laughs> and well, now well, he's, I mean, a couple, he's tied yeah, to A couple of years ago. Yeah, a couple of years ago, you have Magnifico, and we had Magnifico last year, but mm-hmm. they were going to try to, I think, work Magnifico and Sean at the same time, and Sean comes out, has a nice game, but then gets injured. He's done for the rest of the season, so it's kind of his last chance this year, and he's been outstanding with three touchdowns so far. I mean, you're talking about a tight end uh, who is the co-leader of DeMonte in receptions right now. He is only at 37 yards behind him in yards gained this season. Uh, and then you got Calvin Austin, a young guy that has come up, paid his dues. He's he's had some playing time, but now he's going to be basically your number two wide receiver. He's a guy that came in uh, to run track and field at Memphis. Of course, played high school football locally in Memphis, so it wasn't it wasn't a Willie Gault situation where he's just a track guy. Let's teach him to catch the football. Yeah, he had some he's had football experience coming in to uh, to Memphis, but it's a chance for him to maybe step up to where Demonte was a couple of years ago when he was behind you know, Anthony Miller and Gibson and all those guys, and he kind of steps in that role, and Devontae becomes your, your number one, your, your your feature receiver this year. But Sean Dykes is – we've always, going back to Alan Cross, 
uh, you know, Justin Fuente, then Mike Norvell, and then Joey Magnifico. It, it's it's been an offensive system now for the last eight nine years where we have utilize that tight end position uh, very well. What about that? Uh, let me ask you about the defense now on the other side, too, because I'm you know looking through your defensive numbers preparing for this game. I noticed that your top five leading tacklers are all defensive backs. And yeah, any, that, that, yeah <laughs> and any coach will tell you that's probably not good news. Is it like what's the situation with Memphis's defense right now? Because that, that means that tells me guys are getting to the second level right now. Yeah. Well, right, and that's the hard thing to to, to tell right now because you got the new defensive coordinator. You got two games that are a month apart, and, and in both games, Arkansas State and SMU, the teams were able to you know jump out and get some points early in the in the first quarter. And, and you look at SMU again with what it was it eight minutes to go in the first half. They they had twenty four already. They were up twenty four twenty one three, and then twenty yeah. I think twenty one ten or twenty four ten. Uh, so the offenses have been able to come out and kind of throw that first punch. But then you look at halftime or midway through the first quarter, our second quarter in these two games, he's been able to make the adjustments uh, in the second half against Arkansas State. Second half, they were outstanding against SMU because they put up all the numbers and the points in the first half. So all I can tell you right now is he's, he's pretty good at making the adjustments, but they've got to get off to a little bit better start. Uh, let's talk about Memphis special teams because that's always been a weapon with, of course, under Mike Norvell and, of course, Pete Limbo there. I mean, you all have always been tremendous special teams. And last year in particular, you were the one, I think, second best in the country. I mean, you are mm-hmm. in the top five, top ten in every significant uh, special teams category. Just discuss your special teams this year because that's a factor in this game. That's won you games, and, and it's helped you win you know, all the games you've had this run here over the last yeah. few years. I'm sure I'm sure you and maybe some Memphis fans had a bit of a chuckle or a smile there when in Mike Norvell's first game they blocked three <laughs> kicks, and yeah. they talked about well, that. I, I, know in the, I know when Mike Norvell left and he was putting his staff together and we got past the Cotton Bowl, and that's when you see a lot of the moves that, you know, we were happy that Coach Johns and some of the other coaches stayed, but we were extremely happy when Coach Limbo was able to stay because that's a, that's a very valuable guy. Mike was always big on special teams. Probably the, the biggest compliment I've, I've heard, and it's great to hear it from Memphis, and I think it was the SMU game we played last year uh, on national television when we got a, a couple of – either a couple of blocked field goals or a couple of punts is that Chris Fowler had said this is the, this is the new Virginia Tech. Remember under Beamer how good they were at special teams mm-hmm. and how much of an emphasis and how much it swayed games. So, yeah, uh, hopefully it continues this year. Uh, we've got, you know, Riley Patterson, the senior kicker, uh, three for four so far this year. He kind of uh, hit a chili dipper against uh, Arkansas State on his first attempt this year. After that, he's been pretty solid. And he's a guy that I really like because he's, he's the one that had to follow Jake Elliott, who's with the Eagles now who was so outstanding for the Tigers. You know, he had his freshman woes. Then a sophomore year championship game against UCF, you remember he had, he had some opportunities, maybe to tie it, maybe to win it, and just, you know, the pressure moments, I think, got to him as a sophomore. And last year, he really kind of came into his own. He's a guy you're confident now. When you go down there, you're probably at least going to get those three points, which I think people don't ever – they don't ever appreciate until you don't have that field goal kicker. When you know when you get to the other side of the field, you don't have to punch it in the end zone. You want to, but if you at least get three points, that's a huge thing. You know, and you're still going to be solid, you know, punt block, uh, field goal block teams. The big thing is going to be who, or who are we going to have somebody that replaces Antonio returning to kickoff? So that, that, was, that was such an X factor last year. Big, big weapon, big weapon there. And I remember Fowler saying that that was when you hosted SMU on uh, primetime on ABC. Yeah. You hosted game day, and it was kind of like what the year before when UCF hosted game day and then hosted Cincinnati in the ABC primetime game. You would go on just like you, you know, to win the conference championship, just like UCF did that year before. What did it mean for the school and the city to host game day and be in that ABC primetime there against SMU? And of course, would eventually win that championship. Uh, and I would have, I hope, I, I would imagine fans are okay with Mike Norvell at Florida State, or is there some angst there from some Tiger fans on I mean, him leaving? You're gonna always have a, you're always gonna have a handful. You know, you know how it is. Each new coach comes in, and this guy's gonna be the one that stays forever, and they're gonna say the right things. But I think, I think in this day and age, you, you got to realize it's, it, it for them, it, it, it's a job, it's a business. You're not gonna turn down all the extra money you get an opportunity to do that 
and let's face it, it uh, you, you got a chance to do big things down at Florida. You got a chance to do big things at Memphis, but that's a, it's a next fall at Florida State. We, we aspire to be there, uh, but I think I think most of the fans know the deal. Hey, I think he left on the right way. Uh, coaches through the championship game. You know, he's not going to tell you he's talking to anybody. That's just not the way it goes. But there was no, there, there was no. I'm going to Florida State. and I'm going to take these recruits. You know, we went through that with Cal when he left for Kentucky. Took nearly the uh, the whole recruiting class. That's where you get the Yanks. I think everything's. You know, we appreciate the four years. We wish him the best at Florida State. We try to move on. But going back to your your original question about that day in Tiger football. You know, and not to discount the conference championship or going to the Cotton Bowl, but to have college game day come to Memphis, have that ABC primetime game, to win it in a, 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 you know, a thrilling game. We got the big lead, had to hold on to the end, sold out Liberty Bowl. It's, it's, you'll, you'll hear most everybody refer to that as that was the biggest day in Tiger football history, just the exposure the event, I was down there. I got down there at 4 a.m. just to make sure, you know, I knew it was going to be packed, get down to Bill Street, get the good spot. Uh, it was a very long day, but I think uh, myself, as well as every Tiger fan in Memphis, was going to uh, soak it all in because we've uh, all been through some very lean times here, and we would have never imagined uh, we would ever have a game day or, or reach the heights we, we reached last year. Same exact thing that we thought when college game day came here. I mean, what it's it, it the, the thing it was with that for UCF was it was such a massive showcase for the campus and for the program, which was so much bigger than I think any football game could have been. Right? I mean, it's basically an, yeah, it's basically I, an, a three hour infomercial about your campus. Well, I mean, you go you go back to ten years ago. We're coming off. Uh, three coaches in a four-year span where we won five games in three years. And, and I'm not lying to you. You're talking about the Liberty Bowl holds 58. It's an old stadium. So it's one of those big old concrete bowls that holds a ton of people. And there were games when they may have announced 10 or 12,000. There may have been 5,000 at stadium. I remember the, the end of the Tommy West era. We played a rainy Tuesday night game against East Carolina. And I knew it was the end when they announced attendance of I believe somewhere a little under 3,000 people and you know when they announce actual attendance anywhere and the numbers that low they're announcing the actual for a reason so I mean, yeah you talk about some of those long road trips in old conference USA I remember Larry Porter's last game coming home from that from Hattiesburg you know you, you win one game that year two games that year and just think well it's just there, there goes another season so you don't ever even it's not even a fantasy to think you're going to get college game day and the ABC primetime game. And, you know, the last year the big debate was when they announced they were coming to Memphis, you know, it was three days of kind of where are we going to put this on campus over the Liberty Bowl, Bill Street. And I think they found – I mean, I think Bill Street was the perfect location for it. You would like to showcase the campus, but, but last year and the crowd that we had, I think Bill Street was, was absolutely magnificent. It yeah, looked beautiful. What a, what a it party. Looked yeah. It looked tremendous. I obviously appreciated Jerry the King Lawler uh, appearance. Yeah. Uh, there, uh, you got it. You might have gotten us to the edge there. We had Maury Povich. You had Jerry Lawler. You know, plus you had. Well, Penny there Hardin. were some extenuating circumstances <laughs> about that. But, but well, I mean, so, the big thing was was it going to be Lawler, or Justin Timberlake? You know, because he's he's from right outside of Memphis, but <laughs> that's he was right. From a movie down in in Louisiana. Now, now you get a little of the animosity, you know, from Memphis because old JT moved to Nashville, and so a lot of people are like, well. If you're, that's the way you want to roll, and you, you may have turned in your Memphis card, so oh, <laughs> you, you kind of get a little oh, bit of that. That's I love it. Little little animosity. I like that, but uh, that was so <laughs> significant too from the program standpoint because you know prior to this run of success, right? Everybody knows well Memphis is a basketball school and things, and yeah. you know there's that infamous Tommy West, you know, rant. Yeah. Where he's like, you know, you, if you don't take football seriously, you'll never be successful and all that. What you know, paraphrasing. And now people know Memphis as, 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 as well for the football program. It's not just basketball. Yeah, I mean, you know, Tommy's quote was, if you're not going to put something into it, into it, do away with it. You know, it's, he's, and people kind of laugh at it, but when he's saying it was painful, it's something that needed to be said. Everyone knew the story. Everyone knew the deal. Uh, and it wasn't, you know, sour apples. He coached out the rest of the season that year, but it needed to be it needed to be said. Get it out. I mean, sometimes you got to rip the, the Band-Aid off, expose the scar, and 
uh, there were some administrative changes. We switched. Pre- we got an interim president who was uh, Brad Martin, huge Tiger. Uh, he's an alumni, uh, big into athletics. We rolled out of him right into Dr. Rudd, who we now have now. He's big into athletics. So you've had two presidents in a row that, that know the value of athletics. Uh, of course, academics are the priority, but knew the value. Brought in Tom uh, Bowman to uh, uh, Bowen to to run the athletic department, uh, and then we've got Laird Beach. But they brought in Tom, I think, with the with the mission of we need to get football going. That you know, remember we're in conference USA, both both you know UCF and Memphis and a lot of other teams, and they knew they realized at that point when we missed the the ship on the original Big East. Uh, when some of those teams went in 10, 10, 12 years ago, that the football program was why we weren't getting in. You can go to a Final Four. That's great in basketball, but nothing generates revenue like a football program. Nothing gets exposure like a football program. And We needed to get the program up and running. And, you know, having that, that football program go in the last eight, nine years has, has you know, been outstanding just for the, for the community in Memphis and for the school itself. And you try to keep basketball – uh, but it's high level too, and I think Penny's done a good job his last two years. This will be a pivotal year for him this season, but his recruiting class has been pretty good, and now we just uh, – everything went official today about that uh, Sioux Falls tournament since we're not going to go to the Bahamas. But, you know, the Bahamas, Sioux Falls, tomato, tomato. It's all the so, same. It's all the yeah. same. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's all basketball court inside at the end of the day. So it's uh, it's been neat because – there used to be a lot of animosity between the basketball fans and football fans here. You heard, I was, a, I'm a Tiger basketball fan, or I'm a Tiger football fan, and and now you just got Tiger fans, and that was that was probably the best thing that came out of all this getting football going, is now you've got two successful programs, and now you just got Tiger fans. Yeah. 3.30 p.m. on ABC on Saturday, UCF at Memphis in the Liberty Bowl. Mark Jones and Roddy Jones will be on the call for AB, for ESPN on ABC. However, you will hear, if you're paying attention to the Tiger Radio Network, you'll be hearing our guest, Jeff Brightwell. Jeff, where can uh, UCF fans follow all your work throughout the year? Because I know you don't just uh, you don't just pay attention to football like you were saying earlier. It's uh, it's all Memphis for you, and, uh, and, and you follow, by the way, nobody follows baseball in the American like Jeff Brightwell does. I know that firsthand. So uh, where can UCF fans uh, follow you and uh, everything that you do? Well, on the social media, I'm at Jeff A. Brightwell on, uh, on Twitter mostly, on Instagram too, but mostly, uh, mostly Twitter. You'll get a, a lot of Tiger stuff and a, a lot of nonsense as well. So it's always uh, hopefully a, a fun and entertaining follow on Twitter. That's probably the best place to uh, follow. So if you're coming to town this weekend, if you're uh, you know, limited tickets and everything with the restrictions. But if you are coming up to Memphis, uh, our flagship station in Memphis is Rock 103 uh, and 600 AM on the uh, AM dial. So if you're going to be in that, that's where you can hear the radio broadcast. But yeah, stuff on the uh, Tiger Network and the American Digital and uh, knock on wood for all of us on the new ESPN Plus package. Can't forget about the uh, the CrossFit games too, Jeff. I have to get that in as well. Oh, yeah. Ho- ho- hopefully next season we're all back to normal at the CrossFit Games, too. <laughs> Absolutely. Good stuff, man. All right. Jeff Brightwell from Memphis, uh, from the Memphis Tiger Radio Network uh, joining us here to talk about the Tigers. Thanks again, Jeff. We'll talk to you soon, all right? Absolutely. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks again to Jeff. And, uh, yeah, make sure you give him a follow at Jeff A. Brightwell on Twitter. He's an excellent follow. Uh, nobody knows more about Memphis sports than uh, he does. And so thanks again for his time. And insight on the Tigers. 3.30 p.m. kick Saturday, ABC in the Liberty Bowl, UCF against Memphis. Of course, we know how uh, often these two teams hook up, uh, and it becomes an absolute thriller over the last three meetings. Uh, another regular season meeting in the uh, Liberty Bowl. So uh, this should be a fun one for UCF again on national TV. When we get back, we've got some news on uh, from, from UCF basketball, and also we'll talk a little baseball as we as the World Series is coming up. Uh, we're in the middle of the league championship series and a couple other items as well that we'll talk about. Stick around. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. Jeff Sharon, Eric Lopez, Brian Murphy with you here as we uh, wrap things up. Uh, we'll kind of whip around the UCF sports a little bit to give you some news updates. And actually, the biggest news dropped earlier today. We're recording this on Wednesday, October 14th, and it's actually some you know not so good news. Um, Colin Smith, 
announced that he will be stepping away from the game of basketball for an unspecified period of time. He wrote uh, on uh, social media, uh, I, well, we shared the, the post on uh, blackandgoldbanneret.com, but uh, I wanted to uh, at least read the parts that to me were kind of a little bit eye-opening. Um, he said, uh, since I was nine years old, basketball has provided me with many memories that I will never forget. However, this is the part that was a little ominous to me. As my doctor and I continue to monitor my health, an underlying issue has caused us to make the decision to step aside from the game to properly manage my health. COVID-19 has taught us a lot of lessons, and while we are not sure what the future holds for me with basketball, life is about timing, and the time is now to fully take care of myself. Although I won't be on the court this season, emphasis on this, uh, I won't be too far away as I plan to cheer for the best team in the country from the sidelines or wherever I happen to be at that moment. Uh, I also wanted a little bit later on, he said, uh, uh, thanks to my teammates, fans, and supporters over all the years. I also want to thank everyone for respecting my privacy at this time as I manage my health uh, with my family. And trust and believe this isn't going to be the last time you hear about Colin Smith. Love you, Night Nation, Colin. So that was the word from Colin Smith. Murph, do we have any insight on this other than that no uh and that's totally fine i, I think the you know the one thing that we are so uh we're such a, 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 a you know we're so conditioned right now to believe that when something like this happens it's covid related uh as far as i understand it's it's not that right uh, and, and no no reason to infer i think he went out of his way in that statement to say no this isn't covid related but it's something that i guess you could kind of infer from this that Perhaps it's something that COVID could make worse if, God forbid, he came down with it. I don't no, know. No, uh, that's not not. It's not what I have heard either. That this is just something that that no matter the year or no matter the climate we were in, that this is something that was going to force him off the court regardless. Uh, I see. But it's not not fair to speculate from there. Uh, and really, it's just you know, it's it's too bad, obviously, for for basketball for UCF basketball. But um, you just hope Colin really takes good care of himself and is able to come back and play basketball at a later date. You know, he, like you said, Jeff, he did present that emphasis in the post that he will not be on the court this season, which, you know, would lead you to believe that he is looking forward to the future of being on the court in future seasons. And all we can do right now is hope that is the case. Um, but other than that, we don't have a lot of insight over his condition. Um, you know, those things might come out, you know, later months ahead, months in the future from now. Um, but right now, it's really just best wishes to Colin. Uh, hope he's able to manage everything. Hope he's able to get healthy um, and take care of himself. Amen to that. Um, the the numbers on Colin in his two years at UCF since transferring from George Washington, he started sixty four of uh, or excuse me sixty two of sixty three games, averaging ten point two points, uh, five point seven rebounds. And uh, 0 0.4 blocks, 0 point, or 1.7 assists. Um, you know, I, of course, obviously, we're you know the first concern is for Colin and his health. But you know, I, I, we have to at least do a little bit of analysis of the basketball side of this. What does this mean for UCF basketball heading into uh, this season? As you know, we are getting close to the time to actually start warming up for this. What should be a bizarre, you know, well, what isn't bizarre? 2020. <laughs> 2021 season what does this mean for UCF's lineup what happens now yeah for, for those who don't know I mean college basketball start date is November 25th we're you know six weeks away now it's 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 creeping up on us um for UCF the one thing here that really strikes me is the loss of experience uh that Colin brought to this to, to this team I mean he would have been you know entering his third year as a starter he was the only player on this on this roster who saw meaningful minutes in twenty in 2018, 2019, as UCF was was making the uh, making the NCAA tournament, and, and now you do need to fill his role with guys who have you know either you know been here for maybe only one year, guys who haven't played for UCF before, um, guys who have been here for a while but haven't played much in that time, a and so you're really losing a team leader. I mean, you let's let's not be, let's not like beat around the bush. UCF is losing its best player. Uh, at least it's best player from last season. Uh, and so now they move forward with a lot of options that, you know, Colin was not 
your your prototypical like big man. Like certainly he was in the post a lot as a power forward, but he liked to step out and, and, and take shots from the perimeter. Uh, and, and he liked to stretch. And and so Yusef has guys who are you know at or about that size who can kind of do the same thing. I think what comes to mind first is Sean Mobley, the VCU yeah. transfer. Um, a guy who Mike O'Donnell is really high on. If you go back in the archives for our uh, podcast and l- listen to the interview that we did with Mike, back when C.J. Walker committed to UCF in July, and we talked to Mike about what the UCF lineup is going to look like this year, Mike was really high on Sean Mobley getting a lot of run as a starter this year as like a stretch, a, a stretch, you know, three, stretch four. Uh, a guy, you know, who's 6'8", but he can shoot. Um, if you're looking for size, they have that. They have that in Avery Diggs, uh, who's 6'11". We saw him play last year. I think Avery would tell you he was really didn't feel comfortable at times against D1 competition. And going into going into last season, it was difficult for you know Avery. He knew it was a big step up from where he was at JUCO, and and you know in his first season at D1 college ball, uh, he you know he knew there was a big challenge, a big step up, a step up in class. And I think at times he got kind of outclassed. Um, but if you're looking for size, he offers it. Uh, Moses Bull was still on this roster. He registered last year. Uh, he's seven foot one, a, 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 a tremendously raw product. But, you know, we'll see if they can get him on the court this year. Um, but then, you know, as, again, back to sort of the, the, the length that that column provides for the guys who aren't as tall. You've got C.J. Walker and Ibrahim from Uke Dumbia. Now, Dumbia is a familiar face to this program. He's been a high energy guy uh, for the past couple of seasons. You know, a kind of a, just a, a lengthy uh, forward at seven, a six foot eight, a rangy guy. He's not going to be an offensive scorer, but a guy that can really give you good defense, uh, who rebounds hard, who gives a lot of effort. And then Walker, obviously, if he is deemed eligible, which to this point, we have not heard that. So currently, he, I believe, is still waiting for his waiver to play immediately uh, after transferring in from Oregon. He is the X factor in all of this, right? Former five-star recruit. Uh, you know, the first time Yusef, Yusef has ever had a five-star recruit play for them, coming in, you know, first-round NBA draft-type player uh, who can score on the outside, but is also just a tenacious defender, a fantastic rebounder, a guy who attacks the rim. Uh, you know, he, he can do a lot of things. I mean, I really am excited. I think everyone's excited to see him. And now with Colin not there, it's really going to put, I think, a lot more pressure on him to do more things um, because he can do a lot of things that Colin can do just at a little a little smaller size. He can rebound, he can defend, he can shoot, uh, and he can score from anywhere on the floor. Um, those are things that Colin was was pretty good at. And you hope to see that from CJ in a in a you know six foot six foot seven six foot eight body. All right. So all, the, all these newcomers again being asked to step up in uh, in their role for a guy who is pretty experienced. You're absolutely right. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, now is this right? No players remaining from the team that played Duke. So I'm. Um, uh, I know that Xavier Grant was was on the roster, and then uh, uh, a Levy, Levy Renan. Uh, so those two guys were actually on the roster when UCF faced Duke. They just, they were, ex- they were, they were guys you brought in, you know, they were, you know, walk-ons guys you brought in, uh, you know, when the game was out of hand. Um, but they, they're, Fort Lauderdale. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it's, you know, I think Levy was a good, was a cool story last year. They made him a team captain, even though he wasn't, you know, a big part of the rotation. Johnny Dawkins just raved about his, his, his ability to sort of galvanize, you know, players and, and be a team leader from the bench, really. Um, so, but, the, but yeah, so I guess technically there are players on this roster who did play, who did, pl- you know, see the game against Duke. They might have played a minute or two against VCU because it was such a blowout. I'm not sure. But as far as like experience dating that far back, guy with guy who's a starter consistently, guy who's looked for, looked to as a, as a go to scorer, a guy when, you know, when you needed a bucket, when you needed somebody to, can, to you know, cr- you know, maybe pass out of the paint to create a shot, like they don't have that guy. Right now, gotcha. All yeah. right. Well, by the way, it's also worth mo- pointing out about Colin. It's expected. Uh, this was on Wednesday that the D1 Council is going to give the winter athletes 
an extra year of eligibility, regardless of how the season plays out, right? I believe that'll be – I don't know if it's official for another, what, uh, I don't know what the timetable is, if that's official or it's going to be voted on, but it's going to happen, basically. So right. Colin and – Supposed to be voted on in January, I thought. Is that what? It, okay, that that sounds right. So, mm. uh, Colin will get that year just like anybody else on this roster. We'll have that extra year for next year. So keep that in mind as well. Is uh, we obviously the most important thing that Colin's doing well because you know if he doesn't play another dribble in basketball, that's okay. The kid's going to be fine, and he's smart, brilliant. I think he's going to be around basketball one way or the other. But uh, that is something to keep in mind that he will have that extra year. Uh, as all the guys on the roster, they're going to have an extra year to play with. I hope so, because you know, I, I mean, I, I've always had, you know, a, a, as a fan, I, you know, I've always Colin Smith has really kind of been a favorite for my, especially from last year, where, you know, he kind of had the, with all the departures, he kind of had to pick up that mantle, and yeah. I thought did so admirably. Um, you know, I mean, it was a, and it was difficult at times. There's no doubt about it, but. You know, he he was he wasn't too small for the moment at any time. So, Colin, if you're listening, I don't know if you are, but, um, you know, we're thinking of you. We're hoping you're all right. And we look forward to seeing you back on the court again, like you said, sooner rather than later. Um, Elo, I wanted to talk about one other thing that's partly of what you mentioned, because the um, the uh, Board of Governors uh, of the NCAA um is uh, is meeting and they're obviously get, they're they're going to the NCAA will vote in January to change uh, a couple of other rules as well. I thought this one was perhaps the most interesting. The council approved a proposal. This is according to the Associated Press that would permit all NCAA athletes to transfer one time without having to sit out a season of competition. Currently, football, basketball, baseball, and hockey players must sit out one year after they transfer as an undergraduate. Athletes in other sports have already had access to a one-time exception. And, of course, if you're a graduate student, you can transfer without a without having to set up for a year. Um, these uh, proposals will go to the NCAA membership for comment and feedback. And barring something unforeseen, they return to the Division I Council uh, for a final vote in January. That's interesting to me, and I think it's a good rule um, that they're that they're getting rid of the one-time the, – the, the, uh, the penalty for transferring – for just basically you get one one free transfer without penalty now out of all those sports. What does that uh, d- does that change things for schools like UCF in particular with regard to those sports? Well, I think what it means is you're going to have movement. You're going to have guys come to UCF from other places and you might have guys from UCF leaving. And I think big motivation behind this is the expectations that you're going to be a little clogged up on the rosters. I mean, we're seeing that with the spring sports, which I know I'm guessing we'll get into in a moment uh, with, you know, baseball and softball opening practice this week, but those got expanded rosters, football and basketball that, you know, they're all going to get an extra year. So you might have some expanded rosters. Remember you got recruiting classes coming in. So I think it's kind of a way to help out guys that maybe don't fit the plans of that school. Or if that person wants to move on to something else, because, it's going to be a log jam in most of these sports come roster wise here in the next couple of years. I mean, it's going to be a little distorted for a couple of years, in my opinion. So I think this is a way to kind of give some extra options here and help all parties when it comes to figuring out their rosters and what's best for each individual. Do you think on balance, this is a good, a good change? Yeah, I do. I do. Um, look, baseball and softball have done it without punishment. Now I'm curious, does it say anything about, transferring without penalty within the conference because I think that's one where some coaches might have an objection to because I think that's the one that always kind of I don't think coaches mind when players transfer as long as it's not within their own league so I'm wondering if there's a caveat there where you cannot transfer in your own league that's the only twist that I could see happening but you know who knows based on what I see no there is no caveat no limitation on yeah, that, that, your own conference that surprises me a little bit that surprises me a little bit because even in softball and baseball there's a caveat where if you transfer within the conference normally you got to sit out a year uh, otherwise you could just transfer and play right away so no I think this is kind of where the writing's been on the wall I think this helps with everything that we're dealing with I think it's a positive for everybody and fans just have to, here's the thing that we have to all uh, accept the days. And I hope we remember this. 
when in about a couple of months, it's national quote unquote signing day. And everybody's like, Oh, why are we only ranked 58th in our recruiting class? What are we not doing there? Th- those, th- okay. Guess what? Those days are over. Not that I'm not suggesting that recruiting uh, classes don't matter. They still matter, but it's not the end all be all that it used to be because now more and more there are quick fixes via the transfer. We've seen Coach Dawkins go that route to help his program. We've seen Coach Ball Malone has done that in softball as well. And we've seen football has done that as well. So that's to me, we have to remember that when we think about these teams moving forward, uh, we, we cannot overreact to rankings as far as recruiting rankings are concerned because I think that's overblown now because coaches now look for quick fixes. If they can't fix it in the recruiting class, they're going to fix it in the transfer market. It's no different than pro sports where you balance the draft and free agency. I really do. I think that's the comparison I would make. So um, please, people, I don't want to see another article about <laughs> why are we only ranked 66? Why did we get that five-star tackle from, you know, blankety-blank Florida? Why are we recruiting our in-state talent? Can he recruit? <laughs> yeah, well, it goes it goes back to the thing that I have been saying for several years now when we do those um, those re-rankings of our, uh, of our recruiting classes. I do them five years afterwards. It's like, you know, what's the thing that matters the most now? Player development. And yeah, now that matters more than ever. And, and here's the reality. There's going to be guys that aren't going to be happy with their playing time, so they're going to move on. And that's especially at the quarterback position. I think the most overrated, most biggest overreaction is when people like, wow, look at that quarterback they got in the class. Well, is he going to play or not? Because like two years ago, Georgia had the best recruiting class. Why? Because they had Justin Fields in their part of the recruiting class. who was a five-star. You know what happened? He left after a year because he wasn't starting. He went to Ohio State. So how good is that recruiting class if the kid doesn't stay long enough? So uh, I think to me, people have to be more patient and now adapt to the fact that to build a college team in any sport, football, basketball, there's more than one way. It's not just recruiting anymore. It's not just about building a recruiting class. It's also about adding some pieces on the transfer in the waiver market, uh, transfer wire, because uh, there's pressure to win, and that's an easy way to fix some holes. All right. All right. So that's uh, something that will be, again, keeping an eye on going forward. Uh, all right. Oh, we're please, gonna wrap Murph. Up. Please, Murph. Just be – I hope you under, you'll get over the fact that if we, you know, UCF's not ranked in the top 50 in recruiting class, that we'll be fine. Right, Murph? It has never affected my life and will continue to not affect my life. Also, I, I wanted to clear up a few things. Yes, the, the winner the winner sports eligibility thing has been passed, uh, so it's not voted on January. It, it's it's done. It's It's been written and there done. There we and go. So okay. Good. And then just cleaning up something from like 20 minutes ago, you introduced the Colin Smith segment by saying he wrote it on Wednesday. He actually wrote the statement on Tuesday. Um, oh, that's but, right. It did come out late Tuesday. That's right. Well, it came out at three o'clock in the afternoon, which is late for you. I don't. I don't yeah, know. That's, yeah, that's late. That's late for me. Like I'm picking up. <laughs> like my work day is basically done at that point. So that's okay. that's late. I'm I'm starting to cook dinner at that point. So, so yeah, that's late. Um. All right. Uh. What does affect your life, however, Brian Murphy, is baseball. Let's go. Ball practice is underway for the 2021 uh, UCF baseball team, masks and all. Uh, any word coming into this fall season about uh, uh, about the team and the new pieces that Greg Lovelady now has to fit together? I mean, everybody looks great. Uh, clearly going to go undefeated. Uh, not even a question. That's probably going to be a record for baseball. All uh, the arms are fresh. I just don't see how this team loses. Uh, I think they're going to score about 12 runs a game. Like that's a conservative estimate. Uh, no, I, think, I hope I hope Sam's not listening to this because if he is, he's going to hold you to it. They're going to throw somewhere between like 15 and 20 no hitters. Like that's about <laughs> right. Uh, look, they they're practicing. They will go through an inter squad practice inter squad practice on Thursday, which I think I would normally attend. Uh, like I know I did last year. For fall practice. By the way, it's weird that we are in baseball fall practice right now. It's like really strange to me. <laughs> uh, it really is. 
uh, usually it's usually I, I believe it's usually later in the year than this, but I mean nothing is nothing is matters anymore, and everything is strange. Well, I think the guy's <laughs> got to just. I mean, you, I, I, Marif, I mean, Jeff, I gotta wonder. It's got to be so unique just to be back on the field. Remember, they haven't been on the field since what March? You know, the last game they played, and it was taken. Yeah. The season was taken away from them. So, I would imagine in the middle of what was looking like a a, a banner year. Correct. Too. Correct. For, I mean, both softball and baseball were headed for top 25 seasons, postseason, and it was taken away from them with so much uncertainty. So I would imagine for both, and it will focus on the baseball side, while it's, you know, it's got to be weird, but it's got to be some relief of like, wow, we're here back on the field. I can't even imagine the emotions. Uh, it sounds weird, but I would imagine this, it, it, all the players and coaches probably have, this is the most anticipated fall practice they've had forever. Like, they'll never, like they're not taking it for granted is what I'm saying. Yeah, no, because you're right. This is like the longest time, period of time, that they've usually been away from each other, you know, in a spring, summer, fall. Like, they usually don't depart until late May and you hope into June. Um, but now they had to depart, you know, basically on March 11th. You know, uh, that was the night they played Miami uh, when yours truly was headed to Fort Worth. Uh, we, uh, and <laughs> so, yeah. In the world, and everything changed. Oh, boy, everything changed. And so, um, yeah, it's been a long time. And I think just like, I, and, you know, Greg Lovelady said this in a, in a Twitter video that they posted on the uh, UCF baseball account. It was just good to be back, good to be out there, good to see some of the freshmen who are there now. And you can go on blackandgoldbanneret.com and get a full rundown of the freshmen we have. Danny Medina wrote that up for us a couple of weeks ago. Yep. Uh, and, and so you, you just get to see all the faces back and then. They'll start playing, you know, inter squad inter squad baseball on Thursday and get into team practice, getting it, you know, team scrimmages basically. And you know, they'll I, I assume they'll do that like normal for uh, you know a week or so. Uh, they're not going to play. I would, you know, they're not going to play any uh, any other opponents. But uh, I like you're right, Eric. It's just good for them to be back and hopefully, you know, hopefully we can start a season in February. That'd be that'd be dandy. Be great and just get them on the field playing some exciting young players. And uh, yeah. maybe, Mer Merv, we should probably get Love Lady. You know, we usually had him on to talk fall ball and look ahead to spring. I don't know, maybe right around the week of November 22nd, there's a, be a good time to have him on. There's a major WWE pay per view we could even discuss. <laughs> <laughs> that's always a good reason to talk to Greg. Uh, yes, definitely. That's that 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 sounds fun. Softball is also under well too, uh, underway, too, right, Elo? That's right. 30 players on the roster, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to COVID 2020. But yeah, I mean, deep roster returned just about everybody from last year's team that was going to be a top 15, top 16 team was going to be in position to host uh, possibly in the conference championship. So the expectations are going to be as high as ever. 20 of season, by the way. 20 of season, Jeff. Where is time flies? I know. We season, were there for the first up. one. For the very first one, Eric Lopez. You were, you were. I give you credit on this. You were there. This is one of the misconceptions. Uh, contrary to belief, I wasn't there from day one. I, it just seems that way. But you actually literally were. And, uh, boy, t your season 20 on the on the horizon and barely the most anticipated one ever with all the talent they return, not to mention talent they're adding with Coach Paul Malone, who's probably one of the most uh, high-rising stars coaches in the sport of softball. And that's not just me saying that because I'm the UCF broadcaster. That's me saying it because she's been a, a, a hot name in college softball uh, across the board. So uh, from a standpoint of the job that she did at Boise and is doing at UCF as far as uh, the national landscape in softball. So it's an exciting 20th season. Uh, I ditto what Murph said. I Hopefully we get him on the field in February. Obviously one of the things we we'll have to follow is what is the schedule going to be like? Nobody really knows that. I think it'll be different than usual, hopefully not too much, but there will be some differences. And I think everybody doesn't care, though, as long as they're on the field. That's the important yeah. thing. And hopefully, fingers crossed. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll be keeping an eye on that as well. Last but not least, uh, any word from uh, any news from the uh, uh, from the Rays bats, at least uh, it's so far in the series. You know, they're right now they're. They're up three nothing in the series on Houston, and uh, th that has to be good news for Chad Matola, right? It is. Obviously, we're recording this Wednesday night, so we try to wait as long as possible. But Major League Baseball decided that Game Four, the Rays and the Astros would be starting at eight forty Eastern, because yeah, who you know, <laughs> that's a great start time for a baseball game. What you know, 
But nonetheless, you're so, on the East Coast. It's, yeah. It's fabulous. Yeah. Great. So, <laughs> look, what the Rays have done is they've made great defensive plays and timely hitting. And the guy that's been a rising star, Murph, and I want your comments on this because Jeff brought up Chad Matola. What's been fascinating about this postseason, Randy Arizarena, a rookie, 25 year old, they call him the Cuban Rocket. Kevin Cash has called him the Cuban Mookie Best, uh, Bet, Bets, as I can speak correctly. He's been on fire. This postseason for the Rays and has ignited this offense, which has been, a, I think, a credit to Chad Matola. And then you brought this up to me last week. The Atlanta Braves, one of their marquee guys, Travis Darno, has, you know, has had a resurgence of a career in part because of Chad Matola, right? Right, because Travis Darno, a former top prospect with the Mets, really kind of lost his way and kind of refound himself in Tampa Bay uh, with the help of Chad Matola. And, and, you know, really uh, had a breakout season with the Rays. Now with the Braves is really become a postseason star. Had a game a couple of, uh, a couple of weeks ago or a week ago where he had five hits uh, in a playoff game. Uh, and it's really become a middle of the order bat for the Atlanta Braves, who have, you know, one of the baseball's best offenses and, and you know, are two wins away from the World Series right now. So, yeah, that's another guy that we, could, we, could, we can point Chad Matola as a reason for his turnaround. As for Randy Rosarena, uh, look, I, I know people liked him as a prospect and everything, but th the man is insane. I mean, the man is just on one right now, and sometimes that happens in baseball where it doesn't matter what they throw you, you're going to hit it, and you're going to hit it hard. He had another home run tonight uh, on Wednesday. Uh, the, the, he's just he's unstoppable right now, and it's 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 um it's great. You know, it's fun to see. It's fun to see more. Good young players in baseball. I, I know you know baseball has fallen out of the national favor some somewhat uh, over the last you know decades, and it's become more localized. But the sport now more than ever has so many good young players in their early to mid twenties. It's a, just a really really exciting product. But of course, I'm a huge fan, so I'm but biased. Chad, but, but to your point, Murph, Chad has dealt with a lot of young guys, and he's gotten a lot of production from different guys in that lineup. Brandon Lau. I think many thought uh, for a while during the season, right? He, it could have been an, an MVP candidate, would have been an all-star for sure. He's a guy that's developed under them, under him and his watch, among other guys in that lineup. It, I mean, Al Rosarena has just been the superstar in this postseason, but he has gotten a lot of young guys. It's fascinating to see him and Darno being more of a, a veteran, if you will, work change his career around, but he's he's been able to adapt, work with young guys and older guys. No, absolutely. Um, and it's again, it, it is definitely fun to see. I mean, you know, M Manny Margot is a, is a guy who is showing some certainly some potential here after kind of, um, you know, kind of maybe not meeting expectations in San Diego. Um, so, yeah, it, it's a lot about it's a lot about, you know, just working with guys and trying to all coaches say this, but you try to find the best version of each player and what works best for them. And yeah. You know, there's always a ceiling to every player, and it's the coach's job to sort of hit that ceiling. And, and I think with some guys that have been under Matola's tutelage, uh, they've reached it. And certainly, sometimes they've reached it uh, in in meteoric fashion, as as Randy Rosarena has in the well, past three. Especially, there's a lot of pressure there because they believe in advanced analytics, and they love to go matchups. Like they will go with different lineups depending on who's pitching and their style and whether they're lefty or a righty. But there's a lot of uh, thought process behind the lineup. So it, he's got to make sure that a lot of guys are prepared to hit, not just, hey, we're going to put Mo – not, it's not like the Dodgers who, hey, we're going to put Mookie Betts in the leadoff spot every night. Great. That's a hard job. Thanks a lot. I mean, there's a lot of different <laughs> lineups here where – I mean, heck, I mean, you know, they'll have – you don't know on a given night who's going to lead off for the Rays. They have so many different options, so many pieces they use. Yeah, what's, I think what's funny is, you know, one of their best, I thought, for this season, one of their best players offensively this season uh, was a part-time player in Mike Brasso. Uh, and Mike Brasso is a, a really great story, an undrafted free agent uh, who has made it to the major leagues, uh, really had a good year with the Rays, even in a part-time role, obviously was the hero of Game 5 of the Division Series against a team that I will not speak because it just hurts too much. <laughs> Uh, but, oh wow! But, Thank you for that, Murph. I appreciate uh, it. But it, but it, he's another one of those guys, right? That you know, no one really saw anything in Mike Brasso, uh, and certainly something has happened. Something has clicked with him 
where he is a big power threat, big power speed guy uh, who can play multiple positions, outfield and infield. Uh, and, and the Rays have turned him into a legitimate uh, everyday player, even though he's not playing every day. Um, and, and that's thanks to the guys like Chad Mottola. Um, So, yeah, that, that's 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 pretty cool. Um, we should in this segment talking about another UCF player, because I tell you what, guys, the days they're running light in the Korean Baseball League, Korean Baseball Organization, there's only two weeks left in the season. It the got season, us through the summer, man, the KBO. We need I to pour one out. Pour one out for the KBO, man. No doubt. I mean, when nothing, when, when no one else was there for baseball, KBO at five, 5 in the morning on weekdays or if you were so inclined, 1 a.m. on weekends. Yeah, was, I watched one the other week on the weekend at 1 It was great. I mean, that's what they've done all season long. They've had games at 1 a.m. on Sunday morning, Saturday night, which is really good if you're, I don't know, playing poker every Saturday night. Uh, as <laughs> as one that is. Who I mean, that be? Not I. So, yeah, it's been fun. And I'll tell you what, it, the role continues for our boy, friend of the podcast, Ben Lively. Uh, we've talked you know, recently about just the, the role he's been on the entire month of September, uh, he now this is this is great. He finally did get a win. He got a win on uh, over the weekend, I believe, on Sunday uh, by th- by by uh, throwing five innings, giving up three runs to the Lotte Giants. But he got the win. Sam the Samsung Lions got the win. I just want to mention that in other starts this last month in September, where he threw seven innings with one run, didn't get the win there. Seven innings with one and run, didn't get the win there. Seven innings, no hits. He didn't get the win there. Again, please stop caring about pitcher wins. They don't matter. He's the now, Jacob DeGrom of the D- KBO. Every player, every pitcher hates that because they want that W in their, you know, on their stat sheet. But anybody who professes that wins matter – and obviously, this has been said for years, but for any of you who are listening, are, are still believe that wins matter for pitchers. They don't because the pitchers can't control what their offenses do. Hashtag and, kill the win. Kill the win. Thank you, Brian Canning. So <laughs> finally, you know, Ben got some decent luck over the weekend with getting a win in when he didn't pitch his best. But um, but he's done really well. He hasn't lost a start since August 30th. Uh, he's, I think, I think since then he's given up, I believe 11 earned runs in, I would say more than 50 innings. Um, he's been outstanding. He's been really good. Unfortunately, Samsung is not going to make the playoffs. Oh, it's like the Mets. I'm telling you, he's Jacob DeGrom. It's like the, you know, they waste his starts and the Mets don't make the playoffs. The only difference is I'm assuming that his ownership doesn't have the drama that the Mets do in ownership, but that's, (laughs) uh, yeah, probably not. But, uh, so got, well, maybe, Samsung is locked in a market share battle with Apple, so I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> well, we may only have uh, two or three more Ben Lively starts to talk about in this podcast. Can we? Can we pat ourselves? And you might have to work on this for a future episode. Get his stats. What his stats were uh, were prior to him coming on the show when you and I interviewed him in Korea, ladies and gentlemen, exclusively here on the Black and Go Banneret. <laughs> and what were his stats since he's been appearing on the show? Because I feel like we've helped turn helped turn the corner there. Uh, I don't think you're right. I don't think you're <laughs> right because uh, because he de- he did have a pretty rocky summer after he came back from no so he came back from injury. He pitched pretty well, and that's when I think we were t- we we were talking to him right as he was about to come back. Uh, and he had right. a couple of good, and he had a couple of good starts there. But uh, late July and, and most of August were, were not fun for Ben. Uh, he got hit around a lot. Uh, between July 31st and August 30th, he did, he did, not, he did not make it out. He did not make, make it to six innings. Uh, he gave up at least uh, four runs and I believe half of those starts. Um, but again, since then, uh, I think it's now about 40, it's about 45 innings. He's given up 11, 11 earned runs. Um, and, and, uh, well, for some reason only has three wins to show for it across eight starts, but again, the wins don't matter. It matters if you just pitch really well. And he has absolutely done that. 
This has been your Ben Lively update brought to you by Brian Murphy. Get All him right. back into the big leagues. I mean, he sounds like he'd be a perfect know, fit on the happy. Mets. He's a perfect fit on the Mets. Yeah. Any 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 live human with an arm would be a good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, wow. All right. Let's uh, all right. Let's wrap this thing up. What do we got uh, coming up? Obviously, Murph, you're heading out to uh, Memphis yeah! for the game. All right. That's me. Uh, that's me uh, going there on a jet plane. Uh, boy, I really hope. And no one, no one will. Hopefully, understand we this. know <laughs> when you will be back again. Yeah, I really hope I am allowed in that stadium. Uh, and no one else will understand what that means, but uh, but, Murph, really but Murph, you gotta say hello to Jerry the King Lawler for us, who was on College Game Day last year in Memphis. Maybe you can you hang out. Maybe you hang out with the King. Uh oh yeah, I'm sure he'll be just he'll be there definitely. I'm sure he'll definitely. <laughs> be there. Um, but yeah, so I'll be uh, writing stuff with words. <laughs> And I'll probably more importantly, he'll be in Memphis, yeah. ex- a banneret lo- uh, coverage from Memphis, baby. Does one of the great yeah. cities in America? It is a great city, and unfortunately, you know, I probably won't be able to go out to a ton of places considering our current situation. <laughs> um, but uh, but it really is. I, I, I love it's. I love going to Memphis. It's it's. I'm so glad they're in our conference. You're gonna take. Uh, you're gonna. Well, you're gonna take a peek at the FedEx Forum, aren't you? You're gonna swing by there. You're gonna just stare at it. Well, it's not that far from Beale Street. You can walk from Beale Street. All like say like, hey, there, there it is. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> always a always a fun road trip. Uh, Danny Medina, by the way, is gonna have a uh, uh, game day uh, game day guide uh, to Memphis. By the way, for us this week um, as well. Eric, what are you gonna have this week? I will be following Murph as this, this journey to uh, Memphis. More importantly, I will be interviewing. I will have an interview, Murph. I don't know if you heard, but there's a new PA guy at the football games. I, did you know about this? I So no one told me. And I felt like someone would have told me, but no one told me. I don't know who it is, uh, but sounded decent. Sounded like he could he could say names correctly. That was good. That's kind of important in that, Greg. Uh, so, yeah, so I'm going to be interviewed about that guy, the new PA guy, and my thoughts on the new PA guy. Uh, look for it on social media. I'll post that on Eric Lopez. When that comes out, I have a feeling the, the PA guy might as well. well I, hope, I hope it works out well for the guy. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, he's, got, he's got some pipes. We'll Me see. too. Uh, Me too. I hope, I hope it works out well for him. I think he'll be all right. <laughs> anyway. Uh, let's go ahead and wrap this thing up here. You can follow us on Twitter at UCF underscore banner at facebook.com slash black and gold banner at don't forget course, knee jerk reactions from Andrew. Yes. Kuchoff after the and, game. And listen, Andrew's been great in getting those up. And I think the fans really appreciate that. So make sure you take a look at those, uh, immediately following the games, three 30 kickoff on ABC. So make sure you follow that, uh, and follow us. We will have our, uh, live Twitter thread, uh, going for that game, uh, as well. Uh, on uh, Saturday afternoon in what will be a big week in the American, like you were talking about, Eric Lopez. So Huge, huge game. Again, I mean, we cannot emphasize enough. The loser of this game has two conference losses. Really, really is up against it to win the conference championship. And really, with two losses, more than likely out of the picture for New Year's Six Bowl, uh, which yeah. is obviously significant as well. So this is a we, – we always say all oh, every game is a big game, game cliche and all that. This is really a significant game. With so much on the line, can Memphis get over the hump and break that jinx against UCF, if you will, and and take out, or does UCF add to the pain? I think something to look for, if this game is close in this fourth quarter, does Memphis truly believe they could beat UCF? Because you know UCF knows they could beat Memphis. Does Memphis truly believe it, or is in their minds, is Memphis going to say, oh boy, here we go again? UCF's got to, has got to force them to make them think that. Like, oh no, not again. That's the yeah. key, so look for that. Big time uh, storylines heading into this game. So uh, it will be a fun game to watch, and we will be watching it with you uh, on uh, national television. For all of us here at Black and Gold Banneret, thanks for listening. This has been the Black and Gold Banneret podcast. Uh, we will catch you on Twitter on Saturday for the game and uh, throughout the week and in our next show uh, next week. Until then, enjoy the game. We'll talk to you next week.